uh, from the bottom of my heart, say, man, just uh, thank you. I just appreciate, amen, your love offering, your investment. Uh, my wife, Abigail, and I, amen, he said, our family. And so, as many of you know already, we're empty nesters. So it's just my wife, amen, that she's home. i just waiting for me to get back home yet tomorrow morning. And so I do want to say thank you. So much appreciate. Again, also the relationships, amen. Uh, through the years, uh, just seeing you conference day in and day out, amen, and just being able to come before, uh, something that's not lightly, amen, but at the same time, uh, just a blessing. It's good to have friends. Can you say amen? I used to tell people all the time, and I still do, and in the neighborhood, probably 12 good homeboys that would take probably bullets for me, but at the end of the day, in the kingdom of God, uh, 23 years of serving Jesus Christ, amen, God has literally gave me thousands uh, of friends, amen. And so God bless you. We do thank you for that love offering. If you have your Bibles, the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we want to jump over to verse 3. And if you have your spot this evening, you can say amen. amen. The Bible says these words, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things. I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, God. We come before you once again by the precious blood of Jesus. God, I have no confidence in my flesh nor my own ability, God. I depend upon your spirit, God, to move in this place once again, God, we pray. Have right away tonight, God, we come against every distraction, every opposition, every resistance right now by the blood of Jesus, God. Let us leave tonight, God, once again. Changed and transformed, O oh God, by the renewing of our minds, that we may leave different tonight than how we walked in through the doors. And once again, God, we are careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to preach a sermon tonight that I've entitled Total Surrender. I was thinking of a song, amen, that we sing in Chandler and probably sang here as well. But the words, amen, is something that easily, if we're not careful, amen, we easily speak words, but yet not understand the meaning or even what's behind it. To think, amen, that the words we speak in worship, that the ear of God is very attentive. Can you say amen? But the song goes like this. It says, I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my king. 
I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And the chorus goes on and says, I surrender. And I was thinking of that song, amen, because how many know uh, that surrender is an attitude on how we come into the presence of God. It is a way of believers, amen, for you and I as we serve Jesus Christ. The word surrender in the Webster's is to yield to the power or control or even possession to another upon compulsion or even upon demand, amen. Some of us understood when the police officers told us to freeze or to stop. Guess what? They were expecting you and I to yield upon demand, amen. And we come to a complete stop. The second definition is to give oneself up into the power of another as in a prisoner or to give yourself over to something. The first, it's a picture of you and I when we walk into the presence of God, amen, that we have the privilege, come on somebody, and the honor to lift up our hands before God. And what we're saying this evening by doing that is, God, I'm coming before your presence in worship. But not only that, I'm coming before you in total surrender can you say amen i understand some of us can stand here maybe you're new in the faith or, or recently invited and as much as you try to cross your hands come on somebody or keep your hands down amen somewhere we must come amen to that place where we lift up those hands come on somebody amen and allow god to do a work but it all comes down to complete Surrender, how many are with me? It's probably about <coughs> 1989. And uh, I'm actually getting ready. It was an evening night, and back in California, there's Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park. And during October and fall, they have what they call Knott's Scary Farm. And so they turned the whole amusement park into a haunted house. I'm 15 years old. And I remember I'm excited because me and my friend, his name was Eddie, we had gotten some tickets to go to Buena Park for Not Scary Farm. And so I'm looking at the time, and he says, you know what, I'm actually going to pick you up in such and such a time. And so I'm all cool with that. I finally finished getting ready that evening. And sure enough, he pulls up in a small truck. And I begin to think, you know what, Eddie don't own a a white truck, you know. And so as I jump into the passenger seat uh, and we drive away, man, lo and behold, uh, I look over where the keys for the ignition are supposed to be, and he's got a screwdriver shoved into it. And I told him, bro, I said, don't tell me that we're taking a G-ride all the way to Buena Park from Los Angeles. He says, don't worry, he says, this is just to get us to another vehicle. Uh, And from there, one of our other homeboys is going to take us to Not Scary Farm. And so we just begin to chat inside of that vehicle. uh, And lo and behold, as I take a glimpse in the mirror, there's an undercover marked uh, car right behind us. A police officer is following us. And I said, bro, did you know that there's an undercover cop behind us? As he looks in the mirror, he begins to kind of, you know, get shaky. He says, you know what, Frankie, I'm not going to chill. He says, well, you shouldn't have picked me up in a G-ride. Come on. And so we begin to argue in the cab. And he says, listen, man, we know the neighborhood. I can get away. I'm going to ditch these police officers. And we're going to try to find a ride to where we need to get. But he, so he begins to actually speed off. But we hit traffic. He begins to actually take the shoulder, uh, trying to get away. By this time, uh, this police officer uh, began to put on his lights, wanted us to stop. Uh, My friend Eddie said, you know what, Frankie, I'm not going to jail. He says, when I tell you to jump, uh, he says, get ready to jump. I'm just going to let this car plow into another car. 
I said, bro, I ain't jumping from no truck. Come on. And so he begins to speed away, uh, and he's taking him in some high velocities uh, on some back roads. Uh, and so we finally get to an area uh, which we think we're familiar with, uh, only to run into a roadblock. By this time, uh, the police officers had a helicopter on top of us, and I don't care how fast your car is, you're not getting away from a helicopter. Come on, somebody. But yet, uh, as they pulled us off the vehicles uh, and they had us on the floor, amen, uh, can I tell you, uh, we didn't come to a place uh, of surrender, but yet, amen, uh, we were brought to a place, amen, uh, where all we can do uh, is lift up our hands. Come on, somebody. To think that if we're not careful, we can be just the same when it comes to the kingdom of God. Come on. That God is trying to get a hold of you, but yet we try to outrun. Come on. God is trying to do something in your life, but yet we resist the spirit of God. But yet, amen, God continues, amen, to come after us. And all he looks from you and I in this place uh, is total surrender. Can you say amen? To think the Bible shows us uh, that it's Paul the Apostle, amen. In Acts chapter 9, this man is converted. Uh, God touches his life. Uh, what a beautiful thing it is, amen. Uh, when people come to a place of conversion, thank God for salvation. Uh, thank God. God, that we make a decision to be in church and to begin to live for God. But I don't know about you. We need conversions, amen. Conversions say, God, here am I. With two hands lifted up, I'm tired of running. It was Acts 9 at the road of Damascus. Paul is going out to cause more damage to the church of Jesus Christ. We know the story. It's Jesus that knocks him off of his beast. And when he looks up, he says, Lord, what will you have me do? In other words, I'm surrendering to you, God. Come on, somebody. There's nothing else I can do. There's nowhere else I can go. But I'm lifting up my hands. And if you know the story, amen, he becomes a powerful man of God. But it all started with an encounter with the living God. I believe tonight that this week, God has met with you and I in this place. He's encountered you and I. We've had our own Damascus Road encounter. But the question is, after this revival service is said and done, will we still continue to lift up our hands? Will we still continue to say, God, I'm totally surrendering unto you. That no matter what you have in store for me, I got saved at 25 years old. I'm 48 years old now. But every day this preacher needs to wake up and say, God, here am I. Amen. It's not just a one-time decision. We live in a real world. Amen. But yet when I wake up, God, all I want to do is serve you. Come on, amen. All I want to do is live for you. Whatever you have in store for my life. But it's coming to a place of complete surrender. You see, Paul, the Bible shows us when he wrote to Philippians, he's older in the faith than where he was in Acts chapter 9 when God touched him. To think, amen, uh, that this became uh, a way of life for the Apostle Paul, amen. Uh, it was who he was, uh, that if he was going to continue uh, and allow God to do a work, because how many know uh, God has started something good, uh, and you and I in this place, can you say amen? Uh, and if, if God is going to continue. Uh, it's going to come down to you and I in this place. 
You see, complete surrender, amen, simply means complete surrender. In other words, amen, we don't serve God on our own terms. Oh, come on, somebody. I know it's Wednesday. Some of you are tired, amen. But how many know we came to have church? Hallelujah. To think, amen, that so many times we run into people uh, and it's almost as if they've written, written the Bible. Uh, they try to interpret it uh, in their own words. But for most of all, uh, it's according to how they want to live. They begin to try to serve God, if anything, if they are, uh, on their own terms, amen. That's why people love religion, amen. They can go on Sunday and do a few of these. Come on, somebody. And on Monday, they're acting like a devil. On Friday, they're partying in the clubs, amen, and shaking it up. But yet they go back to morning misa. And they feel better about themselves. That's your terms. That's saying, God, I'm not surrendering to you. I'm doing my own thing, but I got religion. Oh, come on, somebody. I feel a little bit better, my conscience. Why? Because I walked into confession booth. I told somebody my problems, but yet you walk away the same you see an encounter with the living God. We don't walk away the same. Come on, somebody. Nobody had to tell me that I couldn't be sipping on 40s no more. Come on. The Kawama. Nobody had to come and say, hey, listen, Mr. Chi, you finally got saved. So here's the list of rules. It didn't happen that way. Nobody had to tell me uh, that I couldn't go score crack cocaine no more. Come on. Oh, hello, somebody. That I couldn't kick it no more uh, with the homeboys in the neighborhood. Why? Uh, I couldn't go out and jack people no more. They didn't give me rules. It simply came because I totally surrendered unto God. Amen. Uh, the day I gave my life to Jesus, uh, I stopped running. I stopped dodging. I stopped trying to make my own rules when it came to the kingdom of God. Amen. Can I tell you, religion can never save you. Tradition can never save you. Cultura, culture can never save you. Amen. But it's the blood that Jesus spilled on the cross for you and I. But it comes right down back to our decision. Do we walk into the house of God like this and say, God, do what you got to do? Or are we sitting in our chairs tonight and saying, move me, preacher? You haven't this whole week. Can I tell you? You're trying to do things your own way. Again, total surrender means complete surrender. I went to Walmart back in the day, a few years back. And I walked in with my daughter. I was pastoring at the time in California. And I walked in and lo and behold, there was a guy that had backslid from our church. He was a young Marine from Florida. And to be honest, man, I, I've been looking for him. Haven't been able to reach him through phone. Went to his apartment. His apartment was empty. This young man was a good young man got gloriously saved, amen, at least I thought. Begin to work with him. He always came to me. He says, you know what, Pastor Chi? I need to pray for my dad. I don't have a relationship with him, but I know he needs to be saved. He lives in Florida. I said, God knows him. God can save him. Begin to pray. And so we did. And as he came to church several months, amen, God quickly began to build a relationship, amen. Once again, 
his father and himself begin to restore something. And he told me, you know what? My dad's attending a church in Florida now. And so everything looked good. But all of a sudden, he disappeared. It's like he fell off of the map. And so as I'm looking for him, lo and behold, as I'm walking into Wally World, or as some people call it, Wallet World. <laughs> oh, hello, somebody. There he is. And so I begin to chat with him. And he simply, before I can get any words in, he says, I don't believe in church. I'm like, whoa. I'm just trying to say, what's up, man? I'm concerned over you, man. We miss you at church. He says, as a matter of fact, I don't believe the Bible. And so when I begin to speak to him and the life he was living and things that he was glorifying, it simply came to a place that in his walk with God, supposedly, he was doing things on his own terms, though on the outward it looked like things were great. Yes, he was coming to church. Yes, he allowed me to pick him up at times. We prayed and believed God for his dad, amen. But it came down to a place, amen, that he simply was living a double life. That in the house of God is lifting up hands, but he wasn't totally surrendered. That when people will look at him, no doubt he can talk Christianese. How many know? We talk Christianese, come on. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, right? And we get away with it, but how many know, uh, not with God. That God looks at our hearts, amen. That God looks, amen, and he wants complete surrender, amen. It's not one foot in the house of God and one foot in the club, or one foot in the bar, or one foot in the parties. Come on, somebody, man. But somewhere you come to a place and say, God, I give you my all. Oh, come on. Everything that's within me belongs to you. I ministered to this young man for a few minutes, at least as, le as much as he allowed me to. And then he walked away. Can I tell you something? Don't let God become rules. What do I mean by that? Don't serve God. And to you, God is only a bunch of rules. Because I'll tell you, you'll be miserable, man. I don't come to church. Or I don't serve God. Or I haven't been saved for 23 years. Because they gave me a list of rules and I need to abide by them and I'm walking around. No, I serve God because I love God. That the day I bowed my knee to Jesus, I fell in love with God. Amen. I knew not what love was until God saved this wretched sinner. Come on. And all I can do while I was on my knees is lift up my hands and say, God, I give you my life. Not just giving God your Sundays. Come on. A Wednesday here and there. You know, people that end up in heaven, it's because they prepared themselves on this side of eternity. Oh, come on, somebody. It's getting real quiet tonight. It's not automatic. It's not like all of a sudden <laughs> we appear. Oh, well, this is what I figured it was. If we can't worship here, if we can't handle, amen, the simplicities that this life brings to us here, what makes us think, amen, that when it comes to heaven, it's going to be 24-7. I understand there's no calendar, there's no time there, but how many know, amen, that it's going to be constantly in the presence of God? God, we're going to be on our faces saying, holy, 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 amen, worshiping the king of kings. But surrender starts here. You see, the Bible shows us that in verse 7 of our text, in verse 8, it says, but what things were gained to me? 
those that had counted loss for Christ. In verse 8, it says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now think about this, amen. This is Paul, the apostle, amen, that's writing to us. And can I tell you, he wasn't a bum, amen. It's not like he was out on the streets, uh, down on his luck, uh, living somewhere under a bridge. Uh, and he says, hey, man, uh, I got saved. And all of a sudden, you know, I just might as well just give him my life. In verse 5, the Bible says in our text, circumcised on the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a scholar, a Pharisee. Come on, somebody. This is the resume of the greatest apostle. He's saying, listen, I had some things. I was going somewhere. I was somebody. Maybe even a little bit of fame. Amen. But somewhere I've come to a place where I understand that none of that means anything to me. You see, the song says, I'm giving up my dreams. I'm laying down my rights for the promise of new life. You see, it's one thing to bring your crack pipe to the altar. I'm speaking of myself. Probably some of you, you didn't smoke rock cocaine. I did. I know where I came from. A hefty bag filled with my clothes, which I said it before, I really had nothing to offer God. It's one thing for us to come in and bring our bad habits, our sin. And God easily takes those things off of us. What a feeling it is, amen, to be born again. To be made brand new. For God to give us a second chance at this life when we done messed everything up. Amen. It's one thing, amen, for God, amen, to take away our sin. But it's another thing tonight for us to offer him our dreams. It's going to get a little bit quieter now. <laughs> You see, you think that if we're not careful, we begin to get older in the faith. Hello, somebody. And we're no longer offering, offering God our dreams. Hello, somebody. That's what the song says. I'm giving up my rights. I'm giving up my dreams. You know what areas God's been dealing with you about? And those are places, amen, that God brings us to time and time again. But if we're not careful, uh, when it comes to our dreams, when it comes to our goals, amen, in our mind, I'm going to be something in life and again, uh, there's nothing sinful about that. But when it counters the will of God for your life, it's like me saying today, I'm going to be a major league baseball player. I love baseball. I breathe baseball. Amen. That's all that was pumped into us as kids. Amen. Was playing baseball. Amen. But at 48 years old, amen, though I can still hit some ball, come on. I'm not coming to a place to say, you know what? Now I'm going to pursue my dreams. That every day this preacher, as I said, has to allow God, amen, to do a work and to give God what rightfully belongs to him. How many are with me tonight? In 2005, we went to Pioneer, 
in Chicago, Illinois. And, you know, every person's dream is to own and have. And we had a beautiful three-bedroom house in Chandler, Arizona. Two-car garage. Back in the houses that were built in the 90s, you had those beautiful kitchen islands. People still like those, amen, for fellowship. I'm talking about a very nice house. Everybody was always at my house fellowshipping because you can fit folks in it, amen. Big backyard, nice front yard, no grass. It was just gravel. (laughs) But when the opportunity came to go pioneer, I didn't care about those things. Well, hello, somebody. To me, they didn't mean anything. And thank God for a wife. Somewhere we can say, well, that's my dream. And again, it's not a sinful thing to own or to have. But when it gets conflict against what God is trying to do in your life, And when God is dealing you, year in and year out, will we still be willing to offer those dreams? And I remember, amen, hearing Pastor Campbell. I knew nothing about the Midwest. But I remember going up to my pastor and saying, Pastor, me and my wife are available. If you want us to go to Chicago, we will go. And if you know Pastor Campbell, he says, okay, I'll pray about it. (laughs) And so we were expecting, man, you know, it was just going to be hip, hip, hooray. But I knew my pastor wanted to get the mind of God, amen. Lo and behold, we end up in Chicago. We end up living in an attic in in the Midwest. And some of you probably know, maybe you don't. They have what they call flats. From the outside looking to the house, it looks like a house. There's a basement. There's a second level, which is basically the ground level. And then there's an attic. And all three are converted into houses. Places. We lived up. We were the people upstairs. My kids, they shared a room crammed in together. But can I tell you that pioneering ain't been... We had the time of our life, amen. Why? Because we surrendered to God, amen. I wasn't holding on to what was here in earth. I was letting go of those things. Why? Because I wanted to do the will of God, amen. And the will of God always requires total surrender. You see, the problem is, as I said, we can get older in the faith and we no longer surrender to God. Thank God for new converts, man. This week, I've been, I've been just, me and my wife, she's, she's talking to me about revival with Pastor Sergey in Chandler. I'm talking to her about revival here in Pasadena. Come on, somebody. We may sit here and think, oh, well, then you missed it. Because from this side of the pulpit, man, I've seen God doing some miracles. Come on, somebody. I've seen people's lives touched, as Pastor mentioned. People's lives that are changed, amen. Why? Because somewhere uh, we've come to a place, amen. We may be tired on a Wednesday night, uh, but we're here saying, God, uh, I'm surrendering. Uh, Whether I'm a new convert, uh, whether I'm older in the faith, amen. uh, I want to continue to have that attitude uh, that whatever God wants for my life, uh, my wife, uh, and my kids, amen. Amen. Here am I. I'm lifting up my hands. Amen. Why? Because I don't care how old I am. You can be an OG to the Pasadena church. Amen. We still need to lift up our hands. First Corinthians 
1 Corinthians 6, 19. The Bible says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Some of you got filled with the Holy Ghost last night. Some of you got refilled. Which you have of God. And this is the part I want to capture. Uh, and you are not your own. We're not our own, amen. I just do what I want to do. Well, you're not surrendering. I did what I wanted to do. It landed me in jail many a times. I got stories. There's only one, amen, out of many times I tried to outrun the LAPD. It never happened. They always caught me, amen. I didn't learn. You see, if we're not carefully, man, that continues to be you and I in this place. My wife, amen, we sit around over a good cup of coffee. Coffee's good. Pastor took me, God bless you, uh, Brother Renee, took me to get some coffee. I like Dunkin' Donuts, so. But we talk over the things of God. And my wife says, you know what, Frankie? Whatever God has for us. When I begin to evangelize, amen, I didn't want to disclude her because most of the stories, people will come, and the only conversation they had with this man many times is where I was going and where I was coming from. I said, you know, there's more to Frankie Chi than that. <laughs> But I wanted to encourage my wife that she plays a major role in the ministry that God has allowed us, amen, to be part of. But she tells me, you know what, Frankie, I still want to do something for God. People ask me all the time over lunch or dinner. They say, how long are you going to be doing this? And I understand some guys can say, hey, until Jesus comes back, praise the Lord, amen. But this man has always made himself available to Pastor Campbell. I've always said, Pastor, whatever you want from me. Me and Abigail are here. We're available. Because I know, amen, that I am a man under authority. I have a pastor, amen. And my pastor has a relationship with God, amen, as well as I have a relationship with God. And my wife has a relationship with God, amen. But we don't make our own rules. We understand, amen, that there is a need, and that is something uh, that my pastor knows, uh, that if there's a need, amen, we're right here. We're still lifting up our hands, amen, and I believe uh, that's what's needed in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, have we stopped lifting up our hands? Uh, or can we still be nudged by the Holy Spirit? Uh, can God still deal with us? Amen. Uh, woman of God in this place, uh, allow your husband to do the will of God. Uh, you don't want to sit around with someone uh, that has missed their calling. Why? Uh, because it's miserable. Amen. Amen. When you're in the will of God, yes, it has its ups and its downs. That's just part of life. But to sit around years down the road, amen, and remember converts and couples and people, you had an opportunity to pastor, influence, impact, and they're serving Jesus today. Come on, somebody. That's what it's all about, amen. But it started with surrendering. A lot of the young converts, young disciples, when I'm home, they want to pick my brain. And I encourage these young guys. Why? Because it reminds me of me many of times when I was a young convert. I say, yeah, man, they talk about cities. And they talk about nations, say, man. Because they're saying, you know, whatever I need to do uh, here uh, for God, uh, that one day, man, God can use my life, amen. Why? Because the calling of God is a good thing. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul can encourage you and I uh, 
throughout his ministry time and time again. Even in this book, in chapter 3, there's a section of him encouraging the church that they can make it. Even though he suffered and he's been through ups and downs in life, amen, and ministry and times of betrayal. Come on, somebody. And in times of just being at a place that you almost want to give up, but yet Paul understands that there's people, amen, that have only been impacted, but are going to continue to be impacted, amen, for the gospel's sake. And so Paul continues to lift up his hands. He surrendered. Jesus was the ultimate example. When Christ spoke the words, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Even Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, understood that it wasn't about him. It was about the will of God. What's the will of God for your life? The church this size, amen. There's ministries. There's discipleship. There's evangelism. I mean, come on, somebody. To think that God can use you and I and yet not take advantage of that in the sense if that word is proper to use in that sentence. That somewhere God saved you for a reason. It's not for you to warm up a chair. Come on, somebody. You know, we're not careful, man. Our, our chairs have butt prints on it, man. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Come on. Yes, help us, Lord. I'm bringing to a close. Verse 8. Paul said, I count them, but dung. Now, I lived in Gilbert, Arizona for a year when I pulled into town. And if you know anything about Gilbert, Arizona, it's the city side by side by Chandler. Gilbert, Arizona has a lot of fields. And just when you wake up in the morning and step out onto your doorstep and take that nice, fresh breath of air, it ain't fresh, and it ain't nice. There's a lot of fields, meaning there's a lot of fertilizer. There's a lot of manure. That's the word that Paul is using. I count it all as dung. In other words, everything he's achieved, Everything he's become outside of the Lord. Everything he grasped for, he worked hard for, uh, he gave his energies to. Uh, everything he owned or even had. He says it was as fertilizer. Manure. The song that I read to you, I didn't sing it. It says, to know the lasting joy. You know, true joy is found in the will of God. True joy is found in surrender. When you don't do the will of God again, you're miserable. Like, God bless you. <laughs> Leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> What I do, or what didn't you do? One more story. So I was pastoring in California, and I had some good couples. And I remember some incident happened in the church, and this couple had got in a fence with somebody. So one day they said, Pastor Chi, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, not a problem. Step into my office. It was a nursery. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
Thank God for pioneering. Amen. He says, we're, we're going to not attend the church anymore. I said, really? He said, Pastor Chi has nothing to do with you. We love you. We love your family. So the words he said. I said, listen to me. You told me you're called to preach the gospel. He says, yes, sir, I am. I said, well, can I tell you something? That unless you do the will of God for your life, you'll never be happy. And you'll never have joy. He said, well, this is not the only fellowship that I can be a preacher. He said like that. Well, obviously, we know it's the only fellowship probably that would allow you, man, fresh off the streets to do something for God. Come on, somebody. I said, you're right. I said, but unless you do the will of God, you're going to be miserable, bro. Walked out of my office that day, never to be seen again. Let's fast forward. I'm coming up the I-8 that takes us from Chandler through the reservation into San Diego. We come to a border patrol stop, a checkpoint. I'm in my minivan. My kids are in the back. Uh, my wife looks over to the right. She says, Frankie, isn't that so-and-so? And so as I look over, sure enough, it's this brother. And so I honk the horn. He's La Migra, okay? <laughs> He's the border patrol now. Homeland Security. He turns over to me. He sees me. And he kind of just, and I wave him. I don't know if he needed glasses, but as he got closer, his expression changed. I lowered my window. I said, you made it. You know anything about a lot of my Marines? They wanted to be firemen. They wanted to be sheriff's department. They wanted to be the popo, or they wanted to be border patrol. Nothing wrong with that. He said, yeah, he goes, uh, I'm Homeland Security, man. I said, okay, how's the family? He says, to be honest, Pastor Chi, he goes, I hardly see my wife. I'm always up in the hills. He's talking to me about the long hours he's spending up in the hills chasing people, doing his job. I said, you still going to church? He goes, I haven't had a chance to be in church. He says, where are you coming from? I said, we're coming from Chandler Conference, brother. He said, how'd it go? I said, well, you know how we roll, man. We planted new churches. Conference was tremendous. Put his head down. He says, how's the church doing, Pastor Chi? I said, the church is doing great. He says, you know what, Pastor? He says, I got to get going. And he walked away. He didn't look happy to me. There wasn't a joy because he finally got the job or career he was looking for. One more verse, Philippians 121. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what it's all about. But if we're going to experience all that God has in store for you and I, I say I because I still want to do something for God, amen. Then it's going to happen when we lift up our hands in complete surrender. And we allow God to be God in our lives. Let's bow our heads tonight. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and respect to God. We just bring this to a close. You're on live stream. God bless you. I appreciate you tuned in. Stay tuned in. The best part is yes to come. Maybe you came tonight or you are on live stream. My question is Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Have you had an encounter with God? I'm not talking religion. Religion, we live according to our own terms. Salvation, 
is freely given to you and I and it was paid by the precious blood of Jesus. Tonight you're here. Have you given your heart to Christ? Now is the time to serve God. Quit saying later. Quit saying tomorrow. We can be here all night speaking stories of people that have told this man, I'll go to church tomorrow and yet get killed on the streets the night before. Because the Bible shows us, amen, that tomorrow's not promised to nobody. The people you read about in the newspaper said, tomorrow I got right. Tomorrow I'll go to church. Today, the Bible says, is the day to get right with God. And you're here tonight. And you've come to that place. You're on live stream as well. And you say, I need to get saved. I am not a Christian. I don't know what it is to be forgiven, but I want to be so, so much tonight. Lift up your hand. Say, that's me. Say, that's me. I see these hands. Thank you. Hands are going up. Any more tonight? Join these honest hearts. You're not right with God. I see those small hands. Thank you. Any more? You say, that's me. I see that hand in the back. Thank you. God bless you. There's another hand. Yes. Yes, that's what it's all about. People coming to grips and understanding the need of a Savior. At 25 years old, I lifted up my hands. I was broken and in sin. I knew I needed God. Now is the time to respond. Lift it up. Anybody else? You need prayer? Lift it up. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Hands continue to go up anymore tonight. You say, that's me. Anybody else, maybe on live stream, you lifted your hand, God sees you. We don't see you, but God sees you. Keep it lifted. Maybe tonight, you're backslidden. You're away from God. You tasted of God and you've seen that He's good. But you went back to sin. You went back to the muck of life. God wants to once again redeem. You. He wants to once again wash you pure and white as snow. Backslider, lift up your hand. Anybody at all? I see that hand. Thank you. Any more? I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. Any more tonight? You say that's me. I see that hand in the back. Maybe you want to lift up your hand on live stream. Lift it up. God sees you. I'm going to do one thing. And I want you quickly to respond. If you lifted up your hand, I want you to get up out of your seat. Come to the altar quickly. Find a place to pray as somebody helps us. Amen. There's a few of them tonight. You can respond to the altar afterwards. Come help us pray with these. I need a man here. I need two men over here. Two men over here, yes. Come, come. Lead them in a simple prayer. Lead them in a simple prayer. Hallelujah. You're on live stream tonight. I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe you died and you resurrected to give me eternal life. Come into my heart and make me brand new. Be Lord and Savior of my life, for all things will pass away. All things will become new. And this day, I thank you for hearing my prayer, forgiving my sin, and saving my soul. Yes, find a place to pray here, brother. God bless you. God bless you. Tonight, church, you're in your chair. Or maybe you're even praying with someone tonight. Have you totally surrendered unto God? You can be here and love God. You can be newer in the faith. You can be an older convert. But are we still willing to lift up our hands? Are we still willing to say, God, not my will. I'm not serving you on my own terms. But it's 
your will uh, that's going to be done. Uh, and God spoke to you tonight. Uh, stand to your feet. Uh, come. Come. Uh, find a place to pray tonight. Uh, let's stand to our feet. Uh, come. Uh, get a hold of Jesus tonight. Uh, find a place uh, at the altar. Amen. Uh, come uh, and make business with God. Tonight. I will 
and I will worship Lift you. Lift up your voice, come on. With all yes. of my heart, and I will worship you. With all of my mind, and I will worship you. With all of my strength for you. Oh, Lord, are my God. Let's give God praise tonight, church. Praise Him. Yes, praise Him. Praise Listen. Many of you have made decisions this week. God has spoke to you. God has dealt with you. Some of you, amen, have come to me and had mentioned what God had spoken to you. And, and that's what we want. But I also directed you to talk to your pastor. Some of you need to do that. Especially tonight concerning what was ministered. But I also want to say, and some of you need to go back home, gather things that link you to your past, bring them to church. And the reason I say that, if we're going to fully be surrendered to God, we want nothing to hinder that. Can you say amen? For some, it's decisions. I let go of my old homeboys. That was it. As a matter of fact, they found me, and I had to make a decision. It was the fork in the road. But it wasn't a hard decision. I chose God over them. That's surrendering. Don't let this just be another revival. God is on the move. And all week, y'all been pulling it out of me and ultimately God's been here but it doesn't stop allow God as I said at the end to be God whether you're young in the faith older in the faith amen and let's see what God is going to do in this place amen why don't we give God praise one more time as pastor comes Hallelujah. God is good tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to close in worship tonight. I invite you to lift your hands. Hallelujah. I know where the evangelist is coming from. I got saved when I was 16 years old. I'll be 48 in November. My senior year in high school when I was called to preach, I was 17. And I asked God, I said, God, where am I going to preach? And I got off the school bus, walking down the steps, and God said, look up. And when I looked up, I saw the front of my school. He said, that's your church. And my senior year, I began to witness to my friends, I began to preach, I began to lay hands on the sick. I saw two girls filled with the Holy Ghost in high school, teachers weeping. And I said, God, if you'll have me, I'll preach the gospel. I have to echo what Pastor Ruby said at conference. We better start paying attention to these teenagers. Because if we neglect the teenagers, the king of Babylon will not. And there are young people here young in the faith and young in age. Can I tell you, do what I did. 
Give your entire youth. Give, give your life to Jesus Christ. Help me sing this song. Amen. Giving you my heart and all that is within I lay it all down for the sake of you my King I'm giving you my dreams I'm laying down my right giving up my pride for the promise of new life and I surrender all to you all to you Lord I surrender believe that lift your voice and give him praise right now hallelujah we surrender to you lord oh tell us what to do yeah oh oh praise him praise him hallelujah yeah hallelujah hallelujah we surrender all father I pray by the grace of God that we live out the faith that you've deposited into us for you have given each and every one of us a measure of faith. Father, I pray as we leave this place tonight, God, that we go rejoicing, armed to the teeth, ready to face yet another day, but in victory because victory is a choice. And we trust you, Lord God, that you keep us we thank you for the revival. We thank you for the man of God. In Jesus' name, God bless you tonight. Hallelujah.